Get the popcorn, Frank. Coming, dear. Treatment in the hospital is they put her on insulin now. They, they're running some IVs to handle that wound because we know it's got to be full of MRSA, right? And they're doing some wound care. And um, let me just do the next slide. So then case one. So she's getting skilled nursing. She's getting physical therapy. So what is what are we doing for her? She's, but what is the skill? What's the skill? So she's getting physical therapy for assessment of the, of the exercise program, some transfer training. Well, of course she is. She had her leg cut off. Um, occupational therapy, they're going to have their hands full because they've got to teach her how to how to redo everything sort of on one leg or from a wheelchair. Everything's got to be lowered in that house. Um, she can't walk with a prosthetic due to the infection. So, and that's going to be a whole long time, and they're probably not going to be able to use the prosthetic that they already made for her, even at the end of it all. Um, they're going to continue working on um, the wound care and getting that wound to heal and figure out how did she get the wound to begin with. If she's got a wound on her coccyx, she was sitting or laying down somewhere in the same position too long, and somebody let that happen. So where is the skill? The skill here, once you get these people home, the skill here is that this woman got into huge trouble. Who was watching? Obviously, either she lived alone or the people that were caring for her really didn't understand how to prevent some of these things. And unless they're licensed clinicians, they shouldn't be expected to. So in a longevity case with this woman, and when we're thinking about Jimmo, in a longevity case with this woman, there is so much to do here that, and, and even if the family does look like they know how to do the dressing changes on both the stump and on her coccyx, again, they didn't know how to prevent her from getting into this kind of trouble. Your assessment skills are absolutely essential. And you cannot be expected with a woman with these kinds of complications, and let's face it, we've all got this woman at home right now. With a woman with these kinds of complications, you can't go in there in two or three visits and teach them everything that they need to know. You've got to go slow to teach the medications, to teach. She's now on the sliding scale for insulin. That's going to take forever to teach her. And is she even teachable? And remember, if she's on an insulin injection, there is no discharge plan. You're not, gonna, you're not getting out of there unless you've got somebody that really does know how to handle that sliding scale of insulin and it's going to be there every single day for her. So that one's kind of a no-brainer. Nice. That one, that is a very long case, a long home care case. And if you do get her to stabilize and if you do get her... Um, everybody in the right place and that wound to heal and she's been hospitalized for that if you get everything to heal you really are going to be there for a while to maintain it and make sure that nothing goes backwards again anybody have any questions about that one any questions on this example no. No. Sandy in this case if this person has got a dementia issue also right um, I guess there are really two questions if, if this person also has a dementia issue how does how would that change um, the nature of the care being delivered at home. Well, that's great. So let's go into case number two then. Next slide. <laughs> case number two, we have a, a mild cognitive impairment. So we can certainly piggyback this onto the, onto the, um, the lady with the diabetes, but in just talking in general about cognitive impairment. So this is an 80-year-old woman at the moment living in a nursing home, mild cognitive impairment, but everybody's going to adjust this in their heads to a patient that they know that may not be mild. History of congestive heart failure, yikes. Um, recent weight loss, hospitalization for a pneumonia and some shortness of breath and increase in disorientation, weakness due to immobility, because, you know, as she was going down the tubes there, how she was feeling, she wasn't moving much. And we all know these 80-year-olds with congestive heart failure, they lose their stamina very, very quickly. And um, acute congestive heart failure. So she ends in the hospital. Case number two, what's the skilled, I mean, next slide. What's the skilled care? At the hospital, they were giving her some IV antibiotics for her pneumonia. 
and they gave her some IV Lasix to, to get some of that fluid off. They were doing some pulse oximity, oximetry, which everybody, by the way, thinks is like no big deal. But as you're putting that pulse ox on somebody's finger at home, you're using your skilled assessment skills to analyze what you're looking at. Yes, any family member can buy a pulse ox and stick it on mom's finger several times a day. But what they don't have the ability to do is to analyze What's happening at different times with exercise, with rest, with laying flat, with sitting up, depending on what that pulse ox number is. That is your skill coming in there that you all went to school for and have these licenses to, to understand what, is, what does this mean? What's, what's going on with this patient? They had her on a cardiac monitor. They were monitoring her vital signs, obviously. She was getting some respiratory therapy for the breathing problems and medications um, were started to enhance her appetite. Well, that's interesting. Um, and she was, she was the, what they've got here where it says three overnights or three midnights in the hospital, what we know is that they want to send her to a nursing home. She's got to be in the hospital for three days. And clearly with this patient, they wanted to send her to the nursing home. Next, next I'm sorry about the beep. Next slide. Um, skilled care. So here it is. Physical therapy to assess therapeutic exercise her gait. Let's face it, we've got to re-strengthen this woman. If she's going to come out of the hospital after, after being an 80-year-old with pneumonia, and she's going to not need a lot of re-strengthening. Occupation therapy to assess her ADLs. Respiratory therapy. There in the boroughs area, we don't do a lot of respiratory therapy at home. If she's still needing a lot of respiratory therapy, she's probably going to stay in the nursing home or rehab down here, other than nebulizer treatments and some chest PT. We're certainly doing that at home. Um, dietary consult because she lost weight. Uh, again, bring in the dietitian. Um, nurses can do that. I don't know about the nurses in the room there, but I, I hate doing dietary teaching. Um, monitor the percentages of eating. That's again, that's really important. You're working very closely here with your home health aides because they're the ones that are feeding or you're not, and you want to know exactly what they're feeding or how much salt is in it, where's all the stuff coming from, and how much she eating because she had a weight loss. Again, the pulse oximetry at home, for all the reasons I talked about before, don't give that away. That's an important thing to understand what's happening with her, um, especially overnight. And then um, maintaining the program. Now, this is also a woman that's got cognitive impairment, and so, so may be the diabetic patient or our Alzheimer's patient. Again, as Arthur said, and we've talked a lot about this, you're not going to, we're really good as clinicians, I know we are, but we're not going to stop or slow down the progression of Alzheimer's, are we? I mean, if any of you can do that, then, you know, sign me up to, to, to walk around with you for the next six months of your life because I want to see how you're doing that. Alzheimer's patients and cognitively impaired patients, what we're doing there for the longevity and what the maintenance is, it's not about slowing the disease. It's about understanding what's going to happen next and teaching the family how to keep that patient safe. Do they need a bed alarm so that we know when they're getting up in the middle of the night? Because I had an 82-year-old fall the other night at 3 o'clock in the morning, and it was heartbreaking. Because although she had a baby monitor, her caregiver didn't hear her rustling until it was too late. She was out of bed. She was on the floor, and it was a mess. So, so do they need a bed alarm? Do they need a door alarm? Um, we're on Martha's Vineyard. I actually had an Alzheimer's patient the other day walk out the door while her caregiver was using the bathroom, get in her car, drive to the Steamship Authority, and do you think she bought a ticket and got that car on the boat at 6 o'clock in the morning and was in the harbor before we figured out where she was? Oh, yeah, that was fun. So what kind of alarms do we need? Um, these patients, as their Alzheimer's and their cognitive um, issues decline, can take a couple hours to eat a meal. So if that's the case, number one, what are we feeding them? And are we getting the most bang for our buck around with protein and nutrition? And number two, how are we dealing with the fact that if you start breakfast at 8 o'clock and they don't finish till 10, what are you going to do about lunch? You're probably not going to get them to eat two hours later. They all have, they, they become agitated. Do we teach the family, why is your mom agitated? It's because she's upset about something. She's uncomfortable. Is she cold? Does she need to use the bathroom? Is she wet? Has she got a stomach ache? Does she have a toothache? I had to take an Alzheimer's patient to the doctor the other day because she had a horribly infected tooth. And it didn't, it was, she'd been agitated for a few days. We didn't know what the problem was. She couldn't tell us. Those are all things that the family finally called me after a couple of days. And I'm a geriatric care manager, but I'm a nurse. 
So they called me after a couple of days and said, you know, you've got to come over and adjust her, her medication. The Ativan's not working anymore. Well, I go over there, and, and it took me a few minutes, but she had an enormous hole in her tooth, and it was awfully infected. That's why her behavior was so bad. These are the things that are going to keep you, and these are how Jimmo can apply. Is there isn't something specific, but you've got to go in and look and see what's happening and teach the family all these different things about all of these patients. That um, There's no doubt that it's justified and that it's skilled. Even if a home health aide is, putting, is doing the home exercise program for you, physical therapists, you know about strength, and you know about people losing strength, like your Parkinson's patients and your MS patients. You can do some testing on them and see whether or not their upper body strength is improving, staying the same, or declining. Nurses and, and home health aides can't do that. We can do the exercise program you tell us to do, but we don't know the way that you do whether or not we're able to maintain the strength of that patient. So if you're on home health aides are doing your exercise programs for a couple of weeks, then it is a skilled service for you to go in and supervise that exercise program and make sure that it's still appropriate for that patient because we all know they will decline if it's not being done right or, by God, if it's not being done at all.